Well, let's look at the book of Zechariah. I'm only going to read the, the first six verses. Remember, the next week is Palm Sunday and we'll have Resurrection Sunday. But I just want to, to look at remembering the past mistakes. So, so I don't know, am I, test, am I seeing a testimony? or No, nobody is. <laughs> okay, we're going to look at remembering the past mistakes. We've got Zechariah. Remember, his contemporary was Haggai. And his ministry dates from 520 BC to 480 BC. He's definitely the author. Zechariah was the second post-exile prophet. He was a contemporary of Haggai. And as I say, there, as we look at this, this is no fairy story. This is history. This is factual. And so Zechariah's first prophecy was uttered some two months later than Haggai's first message. Remember, we looked at Haggai a few weeks ago. And so Zechariah um, probably wrote the second part of his book, that's chapters 9 to 14, around 480 BC. Even though Zechariah spoke to a remnant of Israel, his message was very different from the prophet Haggai. Therefore, this book is all about establishing the kingdom of God through the Messiah. And who is the Messiah? None other than Jesus Christ who came. Now Haggai had to, he had to rebuke the people most of the time because they had lacked their passion, their zeal had gone. They, they were more focused on themselves rather than the things of God. But Zechariah speaks more to the city of Jerusalem uh, and its history and the nation's connection to it. In fact, he describes the rejection of the Messiah by his own people. But he also, here in these first few verses, talks about repentance, the need of it. However, Zechariah, he has eight visions, we'll see that over the coming weeks, to comfort a discouraged and a frustrated People, remember, they were at Babylon and they returned. But they were discouraged. Things weren't going well. And sometimes in life we can get discouraged and we need someone to come along and encourage us. The prophet began with a stern call to repentance because divine favor is linked to faithfulness. Sadly, most believers are not interested in spending time in prophecy. That's why we hear very few preachers or, or ministers going to the book of Zechariah or some of these other prophets. And even some Christians fail to read them because they're maybe difficult, they're maybe, <coughs> maybe more of a challenge to try to read such books. Therefore they think, why do I need to learn about prophecy? But it's all about being faithful. In fact, it prepares us because the more you know about prophecy, you will live for Jesus Christ. The name Zechariah comes from two words. The first one is to remember. When we look at the story of Exodus, we remember that Jacob and his family went down to Egypt because of a famine. But a new king had, had arisen in, in Egypt, the Pharaoh. And he wasn't as kind as, he, as the previous Pharaohs were to Joseph and the family. And they were put into slavery and bondage. And so the people of Israel cried out to God and God remembered his covenant with them. And even when they came out of Egypt, the Lord told them to remember this day. You read that in Exodus 13 and 3. After all, when God remembers, he responds. He remembers the covenant he made with them. So God responds. And when you cry out to him, he remembers Therefore, there was no escape from the past in the ruins of Jerusalem and Zechariah's day. Wherever they looked, there were charred ruins. Remember the Babylonians had come and destroyed their city, destroyed their temple. So everywhere people looked, you would see the charred ruins of destruction. And they were a perpetual reminder of what had happened because of the past sins of the nation. 
Therefore, the warning was, do not repeat the mistakes of your forefathers. Do not repeat the mistakes of those before you. This is the warning the prophet gives. And so this morning, we're going to have um, these reminders, four reminders. One was the authority. The second reminder was the anger. The third reminder was the ancestors. And the fourth reminder was the acknowledgement. Wow, someone's getting excited already. (laughs) Isn't that great? (laughs) Okay, so I'll read it verse by verse. The first reminder was the authority. What does Zechariah chapter 1, verse 1 say? And just if you, some of your Bibles, you might have a little header above it, and it simply says a call to repentance. Now, this is what it says, and sometimes you read this information and you think, maybe this is, what's, what's this got to do with me? Well, what it says is, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet saying. And you probably gathered by now many of these prophets, when they, when they have the verse, they kind of split it, so say, and that's it. So what we get is the first reminder was the authority. And we look there at verse 1. What we have is the Persians are in authority. The Babylon, Babylon has fallen. The Persians are now in authority. And it says it was the eighth month in the second year of Darius. So we've got information and we can back that up with sources outside of the Bible. It's October, November, 520 BC with the Persians in power. In fact, this was the rainy season, which was two months after Haggai had prophesied to the people. The identification of the year in terms of the Persian reign highlights that the people of God are in subjugation. They no longer have their independence. They have, yes, they have returned to their land, but they have had not gained their former independence. And yet they were still having to live with the consequence of their rebellious fathers in the past of a former generation, they were suffering because of them. But what's the perception here? When we we think, wait a minute, the eighth month, when we look at numbers, in the Hebrew language, numbers, the, the, the Hebrew people looked upon numbers to be very significant. For example, the number eight had to do with the kingdom. It had to do with redemption. It had to do with renewal. That's how important. That's what, when you mention eight, that's what would come to mind. Yet the information is there for us to respond to it, to have a greater perception of the authority. At the same time, this is the second year of King Darius. And what does the number two? It gives us two opinions. We have man's view and we have God's view. But how do we respond to God's way? God wants us to respond to him. Therefore, it is what we will do for God. What will we do for God? Will we stand in opposition to the things of God or will will we walk in the ways of God? How do you perceive all this? But then we have the prophet himself. The Old Testament book begins with this statement that the word of God came to the prophet. This is an affirmation of Zechariah's authority, his commission by God to speak to them. Yet the word of the Lord is the best source that justifies the book and its authority and its authenticity. However, Zechariah's message begins abruptly. There's no formal indication of whom it is written to. Nevertheless, it is clearly the case that the prophet is speaking to the people of Jerusalem. So here's a man, and he's got God's authority. You know, the Lord says, go out, and we go out with his authority to share his good news with others. So God's authority is much more powerful than any Persian king, because these empires would fall. But then we get this pedigree um, of the prophet. This genealogy contrasts with the anonymous introduction in the book of Haggai. 
This pedigree of the prophet helps us to distinguish him from other uh, Zechariahs in the Bible, because other Zechariahs were mentioned in the Bible. Therefore, he is described as the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah. When you read Ezra, the, the, the book of Ezra, it gives the same information. Uh, when you read Ezra 5 and 1, it talks about Haggai and Zechariah and, and names names him and whose son he is. He's the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo. Even Jesus Christ mentions him in the New Testament. When you read Matthew 23, 35, Jesus says this, on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. So Jesus recognizes him. And yet some scholars would try and say it's another Zechariah, but it's quite hard when you've got, uh, you know, when you get his genealogy, he's the son of Berechiah and the son of Edo. So Jesus mentions him. How much authority uh, do we need on this? Therefore, we have a prophet who is speaking with the authority of God, and he's got this rich pedigree. So there we have our first reminder, and it's the reminder that God is the ultimate authority. So we get a second reminder looking at verses 2 and 3. And the second reminder was the anger. Let me read verses 2 for you. The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Hmm. The Lord has been very angry with your fathers, that's it. That one verse and said the same fathers, I'll, I'll say forefathers. The prophet reminds his listeners that they did not have a glorious past in their forefathers. Hey, when I look at my forefathers, nothing but drunks. When I look at it, <coughs> drunks and troublemakers. That was my background. That was my history, having a form of religion but denying the power of it. Yet this was an inescapable fact that had shaped their national destiny over the years. The Lord had been angry with the previous generation and it ended with tragedy in the events of 586 BC when the Babylonians came down and conquered Judah. In fact, Ur emphasizes the people's links with the past and with their forefathers. Therefore, the danger was that the current generation would slip into the wrong ways of thinking and become like their forefathers. And that's a danger for us. We could slip into the old ways. And God doesn't want that to happen because, because we'll read, as we read on, we see what the story is saying. It's interesting in verses 2, when it mentions that word very angry, let's in fact, let's never forget biblical history because God was very angry with their forefathers. And, it's, and sometimes people have this image of God sitting in the clouds and he's got a big stick and he wants to beat everyone and thinks he's constantly angry. No, God, God is long-suffering. God is patient. God is merciful. God is kind. But we must see God in his entirety and who he is. It's interesting that that word very angry uh, it speaks of throffing. Have you, have you ever seen someone angry and, the, and the, the, the saliva all comes and it's white? I believe the Hebrew word today means whipped cream. As you whip it up, it becomes all white. But an ang we see angry dogs throffing at the mouth. That's the kind of picture you get. A picture of God throffing at the mouth over their forefathers who were exiled some 70 years ago. And it's interesting what Jeremiah says. He says in Jeremiah 7, 25, 26, he says, Since the day that your forefathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have even sent to you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they did not obey me, nor incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their forefathers. In other words, God was sending them prophets to warn them don't do this and God's not a God that wants to have all these rules and to spoil life that you can't enjoy your life but if you see 
As a child, I fell into the coal fire. And so ever since that time, my parents were constantly telling me, keep away from the fire. Not because they didn't love me, but they loved me. And so God has got certain laws and, and regulations to protect us. This is what it's about. And yet God had allowed the people to return back to the land with a hope. He had, this is how merciful he is. With a future, but if they go the old ways, then things would go the same. But the people, are they going to respond to God's plan? Are they going to make the same mistake as their forefathers? And sometimes we make the same mistakes over and over again. I've come across many that have dealt with alcohol issues and the same mistakes are made over and over and over again. I've seen it in my father constantly until finally he changed his ways when he almost died. But we must learn. So we get verses 3 here. It says, Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Three times it's mentioned there. Lord of hosts. We get this failure. The stress, the obvious, the, the obvious thing here is, to repent. The, repent. That's what he's trying to get out. The past failures, they, they were obvious. They were there to see God has given you another chance. That's what he's saying. God's given you another chance here. Take it. The call to repentance was stressed before the promise of mercy in this verse. This title, Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts, stressed three times in this little verse. To stress the power and the dominion of God. Therefore the people should give careful consideration to the warning. God has given them another chance. Take it. Because God is forgiving. When we think about it, we must understand the, the character of God, of God's anger in the context of his obedience and forgiveness. So this is a promise based on mercy and the forgiveness of God who loves us. We hear of the story of Hosea. He was another prophet. And God asked him to do a strange thing. He told him to marry a prostitute. And God was, through this illustration, was showing, was showing him how he loved his people. God was still loving his people, even though, like, like a man and a wife. Can you, can you imagine the wife going away, living with other men? And then God says, go and buy her back from the slave market. And that's God's care for his people. He's willing to give us a chance to take us back, even when we mess up, and sometimes we mess up. So God is forgiving. Return has many meanings in the Hebrew language. The verb could mean return to the promised land, which they had done. They had made great sacrifices to return to the land. However, they must ensure that they had learned the spiritual lessons from the past. It's interesting what Micah says, From the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinance. You have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Quite powerful words. This return has to do with God. He's, extend, he's extending his mercy to them. He wants them to respond to him. In fact, there, this is the promise of God returning to us and we respond to his call to return to him. But Israel needed to return with a more genuine devotion to him. If God's promise became a reality in their life, after all, this has to do with God's power to bring about his will so it can become a reality. Yet, his will can become a reality in our lives if we remain faithful to him rather than angering him. Quite powerful when you really think about that. Let me read verses 4 as we look at the third reminder. We've looked at the the first two reminders about the authority and the anger. The third reminder was about the ancestors. So let me read from verses 4 for you as you follow the, the same passage of Scripture. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached. Say, thus says the Lord of hosts, 
Turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear nor hear nor heed me, says the Lord. The prophet Zechariah reminds his listeners of past rebellion, the past rebellion of their ancestors. And you just need to go into the books of, of some of the Old Testament prophets. You need to, if you read some of the history of it, you can understand how they had rebelled, how they rejected God's prophets, how they beat them up and how they mistreated them. So the decision is theirs. We all have decisions to make. The prophet Zechariah reminds them, Yet there is always a strong influence from one generation to the next generation that we can influence people either for good or for bad. But the bad example of their forefathers was such that they had to make the right decision. Remember we were saying that too, you know, it kind of sticks out. What way are you going to go? Are you going to go God's way or are you going to go your way? A decision needs to be made. The bad example of their forefathers was such that they had to make this right decision. Therefore, they had to distance themselves from the evil attitude of their forefathers. In fact, their ancestors had been so hard on their attitude that they no longer became responsive to God. That's why Isaiah says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. The former prophets highlight we get the status of the prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. After all, those prophets like Isaiah told them, change their evil ways, change your deeds. Yet the authenticity of earlier prophets endorsed the, the fulfillment of what's been predicted. In fact, they preached about repentance and the abandonment of all their evil ways. It's interesting what Malachi says, but you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord. So you can see the, the passion of the prophets. It's not because they're, they're more righteous or they're better than anyone else. It's nothing to do with that because God wants to bless people. God wants to, to heal people. God wants people to be in the, bless, the best possible place. So it's not knocking people down. It's not condemning them. It's getting people to go in the right way for God. This is what this is all about. However, their ancestors paid little attention to the prophets, so pain and disaster had come upon the people. And so what we see, if you don't study the prophets, you might be heading for a spiritual disaster. Now, I'm not talking where you spend eternity, but I'm talking about if you're alive at the end times. And I believe we're getting very close. Maybe we're actually in the end times. If they said it was near the end times in, in the New Testament, uh, we're very much closer to it. If you are not being faithful or doing the things the Word of God would have you to do. For example, God wants you to read about prophecy. He wants you to understand it for a reason. Yet there is a relationship between prophecy and repentance, which is about bearing good fruit. That's what John the Baptist came and said, Let's bear, that you bear fruit unto repentance. But their problem was this deafness. We become, people can become spiritually deaf to the words of God. And so many people, you can tell them about Jesus. You can share the good news, but it's as if they're deaf to spiritual things. And we need to be on the right path so we can do the right deeds and not sin. Furthermore, the word for listening has to do with a clear purpose. In the Hebrew, that word is shama, to hear, to listen. And it's interesting what it means. Yet this listening is with, you listen with the purpose of responding faithfully by wanting to hear. I want to hear what God's got to say so I can obey God. That's what it means, the shama. However, their ancestors became spiritually deaf to the prophets and did not want to hear them. And today it's much the same. If you say this is a sin, people are, no, no, no. This, this is the attitude. Nobody, you say anything about God, people are not interested. Therefore, when I can hear what God is saying, then I can respond by obeying what he is saying 
Because I want to hear what God is saying and I want to listen to what God is saying because I want to become a better person. And I can only do that through God and I can only do that by hearing and obeying and living for him. So there we have three reminders. The authority, the anger, and their ancestors. And we look at one more reminder in this text this morning. The fourth reminder was the acknowledgement. Looking at verses 5 to 6. What does verse 5 say? Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? What the prophet is doing is reinforcing his point. This kind of rhetorical question is asked to get information. It's not asked to get information, but it's asked to reinforce the point. In fact, the prophet wants them to acknowledge and remember what has happened. See all this? It's this remember, remember what has happened. Yet both the forefathers and the prophets of the past, they were long dead, removed from current affairs. However, this history lesson asks them, where are your forefathers who went into exile? This is what he's asking. Obviously, the, the answer is obvious. Oh, I better be careful with that word, obvious. Gabby keeps saying I'm using it. I went to a conference the other week and everyone's seen it, so I picked it up and I'm seeing it all the time, so I better be careful using that word, obvious. <laughs> well, it's obvious what's happened. I've said it. <laughs> okay. Their forefathers had been killed or taken into captivity. Why? Because they ignored the word of God. They would not listen to what God was saying. So he's reinforcing the point here. But he wants the people to respond. Now what is so significant about the death of their forefathers and the prophets? What's so significant? After all, nobody could deny those facts because time runs out. The message comes to an end. You won't, I won't preach this message um, all day today. It will come to an end, I can assure you. And when the prophet spoke, the message came to an end. For the prophet, this meant means there is an ending to the prophecy because there's a time frame. At the same time, the prophets do not call repeatedly when we fail to respond and to listen. God will not always speak. There'll come a time when he will stop. If you ignore him, you reject him. Like their forefathers, their hearts became hard and they couldn't get through. So the people are being urged to acknowledge their need to respond while they can, while there is still time to respond. There's this, so we have this reminder. We need to be reminded about what this has got to do with us and to acknowledge it. Those who lived and died and sin are in torment. They were warned by Moses and the prophets. We get, Jesus gives us this, this parable. It's in the Gospel of Luke about the rich man and the poor man. The, the poor man's called Lazarus. The rich man had everything he needed and the, the poor man would be just eating the crumbs from his feet almost. But, the, but both had died and this is, Jesus tells the story. And the rich man ends up in a place where he's tormented. There's fire, it is horrendous. And he feels that this is so horrendous. He, he knows he cannot escape, but he wants, he wants to warn his family. And Jesus says to him, Abram said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear. So it's important that we hear the word of God. We cannot continue to ignore it. And yet those who live and die in Christ are in paradise. That's what Jesus, remember he was crucified and there was two thieves on either side and one of them repented. He, he, he made it right with God and Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And so there are two places we can end up and just read the words of Jesus and you'll find out. It's pretty clear. So let me read the very last verse this morning. Verses 6. Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? 
So they returned and said, Just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us, according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. God's word and statutes contrast with the short-lived lives of their forefathers. After all, the people who rejected the words of God by the prophets were dead and they were gone. However, the word of the Lord was still living, it's still active, it stands the time. Many years ago, Scotland was a nation that preached the gospel. It was known as the land of the book. And when our Queen, Queen Mary of Scots, her John Knox praying, she was afraid of John Knox because he was a man of prayer. This was one of our queens. And here, these people have gone, the John Knoxes, these great men, those great men and women that prayed for revival that hit this nation, they've gone. However, the word of God is still around. God's word is still alive. God's word is still real. God's word stands the test of time. Voltaire, who, who said, he quoted that, that the Bible would disappear and yet... His house became a printing press for the Bible. The Word of God is going nowhere. It stands the test of time. But they had broken the requirements of the covenant. So what happens when you break the, the terms of the covenant? The curses came upon them. That's what had happened. In fact, that had come true in the case of the forefathers. And so if it had come true with the forefathers, it would come true for them. But there was this rejection. The words and status and commands had overtaken their forefathers. And it's an interesting picture, this. I mean, these, these men that wrote the scripture didn't have their iPads or, or all these gadgets. But yet they use these pictures, these words that brings the scripture alive so we can get a picture from it. This, this overtaking pictures, it's like fleeing from a hunter. A hunter is after you and you get caught. In fact, this simply means the words of the prophets were true and disaster had come upon the people. Why? They ignored God continually, perpetually. And yet, they set before the people. The, what was set before the people was God's pathway or their pathway. By rejecting God, they were rejecting God's pathway. And so God has got the, the narrow way that we should walk in. If you go on your pathway rejecting prophetic words and truths, you will be overtaken. So let's be in recognition of this. The people may deny God's word. People may try to run away from God. But God's word will always take, catch up with you. You cannot escape God. There are many people I hear the stories that try to run away from God, but wherever they go, they seem to find another Christian that will tell them the same thing from the Word of God. You cannot escape God. He's everywhere. He's too big to run away from, as the psalmist says. In fact, God speaks. And what had happened, they denied God's Word. They were failing to recognize God's word. Their forefathers were caught. Many were enslaved. Many were murdered. Many were, were taken and starved and mutilated. Acknowledging this has a negative meaning in the text, just as God said he would do it to them. And it's the same today. If God says there's a place called heaven, if he says there's a place called hell, he means that. And you've, we've constantly been told about these things from the Word of God. And we can choose to ignore that. But at the end of the day, we're not robots. God gives us the free choice to choose if we'll walk with Him, if we'll serve Him, if we'll believe Him, if we'll trust Him. But we know the story. It's taken the trauma, the destruction of Jerusalem to bring the people back to recognize what had happened. So God is leaving them in verse 6 to reflect upon these things, on the present situation. Look at what God has done. He's brought you back. He's given you another chance. God has completed the seven years that he told the people. And God's plan from the beginning, and even today God's plan for our life, is to bless us, to help us, to encourage us, to do good things for us but if we choose to ignore them how can we expect to be blessed and helped but if we reject that pathway and go the other way 
then there's going to be disaster. That's what the prophet said. There will be a curse rather than blessing, but God brings them back and he's given them this other opportunity. So how do we conclude this morning? The people are reminded of their past mistakes by showing the change in the authority. God is the ultimate authority. Still speaking through the prophets. We have all these prophets in the Old Testament. By rejecting God, you anger God. God wants them to learn the mistakes of their ancestors. Give them another chance. God is forgiving, so they should acknowledge these things so they don't repeat the same mistakes. We always say we, history always repeats itself, so let's learn the mistakes of history, but we fail to do that. After all, the Lord wanted them to return to him with a wholehearted obedience. Now, a sensuous, irreligious life means the loss of God's grace and mercy and blessings. Yet, it's all about being on the right course, the right path, so we don't sin because the Word of God is there to guide us, to help us. But this is to get our attention, so, so we do acknowledge the deeper message and if we acknowledge God and his message and his word we start to see the deepness of his word and when we start to believe what his word is saying that will move us and that's what the prophet is trying to get the people to to be moved to be encouraged by what God is saying responding to what he is saying so we are able to respond in faithfulness to be part of his kingdom part of his great kingdom and so we have these four reminders about the authority, about the anger, about their ancestors, and the acknowledgement. So remembering the past mistakes, today is the day that you can serve the God who gives a second chance. Maybe you find that message is not for you. Maybe there's someone you know that needs a second chance. God is in the business of giving a second chance. If we mess up, we make mistakes. He is there to forgive. Let's trust in him. And let's learn some of the lessons that we have looked at in these six verses this morning from the prophet Zechariah. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for Calvary. We thank you that for the New Testament covenant. The Lord, for your, if it wasn't for your mercy and your grace, Lord, we would be consumed. And Lord, we come before you, the awesome God, who died, who shed your blood for us. Lord, let us pay attention to what your word is saying. Let us listen carefully to what it is saying. And let it not go in one ear and out the other. But let's be studious of your word, acknowledging what you're saying because what you've written is all because you love us. That's what it's all about. And so we thank you this day. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen may the lord bless you this day and please feel free have a cup of tea speak to someone share a word of encouragement to someone